But I think there is another path and, and there's another possible future for, for humanity, which actually could be very positive, but it involves, it involves a certain kind of collapse, not a collapse of civilization itself, but a collapse of this capitalist system that is driving us to this, these bifurcations, driving us to this completely unsustainable path, this notion of endless growth on a finite planet that we're on right now. And this, this path would be to actually move towards a civilization that some people, and I've, I've taken up this phrase myself because I love it, and some people call it an ecological civilization. Basically, I'm laying the groundwork for a civilization um, that's founded on a different basis, rather than one that's based on um, wealth accumulation, exploitation and extraction, one that's actually built on life affirming principles, built on the same conditions that allow ecosystems to thrive for millions of years, uh, sustainably and in, in great health. Um, and a civilization that actually starts off by setting the conditions for all humans to be able to flourish on a regenerative and on regenerated earth. Jeremy Lent is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Jeremy, described by Guardian journalist George Monboy as one of the greatest thinkers of our age, is an author and speaker whose work investigates the underlying causes of our civilization existential crisis and explores pathways towards a life-affirming future. His award-winning book, The Patterning Instinct, A Cultural History of Humanity's Search for Meaning, examines the way humans have made meaning from the cosmos from hunter-gatherer times to the present day. His new book, the web of meaning. I've got it right here. I absolutely love it. I'm in love with this book. Um, I've read both books, uh, but this book is the, the tell all. I absolutely love it. Integrating science and traditional wisdom to find our place in the universe offers a solid foundation for an integrative worldview that could lead humanity to a sustainable, flourishing future. He is the founder of the nonprofit Lilogy Institute and writes topical articles exploring the deeper patterns of political and cultural developments of meeting. Jeremy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Thanks. I am too. It's so it's so good that we could connect and and uh, we're trying to collaborate and work on a few projects together. Um, and, and and for me, that's just uh, so wonderful because there's so much alignment. I, I first and foremost want to start out kind of really basic for my guests and listeners who don't know you, who who've never heard of you or, or your book, kind of. Uh, if, if you don't mind, tell me how you got on this path of doing what you do. And uh, when we talked, spoke earlier offline, you said you're kind of new to the scene as far as an yeah. author and speaker in, in, the, in this subject matter. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, and maybe the, the place to begin is to just kind of notice that those two books you were just talking about, they both have the word meaning, uh, like in their title or subtitle, like there's the patterning instinct, a cultural history of humanity's search for meaning, and then this new book, the web of meaning. Um, and I think that uh, it's, it's kind of, that's a key indicator of uh, how I got to this place where I'm a writer and what I'm writing about is it was very much around my own search for meaning about my own uh, realization, sort of in the middle of my life, kind of a midlife crisis, if you wanna label it like that, um, where I realized that the way I had been living my life was not fulfilling that sense of meaning. I really wanted to understand what that was about. Because um, in fact, the first half of my adult life was actually spent uh, in business. I got an MBA. I started an internet company during that first dot-com boom. 
um, and uh, took it public. I was CEO of the company and ha having a grand old time flying around the country and the world. And um, then things began to kind of crash around me. My wife at the time, uh, she, um, she passed away some years back, but she got very sick. And um, I left the company to look after her, but I left the company when it, it was too young and, and, uh, and it then collapsed a year or two after I'd left it. Meanwhile, my wife um, had, was suffering from cognitive decline. And, and so the person I'd, I'd loved that I'd been with ever since I was 21 years old, I was no longer even being able to relate to, even though I was looking after her. So it's like everything collapsed around me. And that was terrifying. And, and I went through years of what like felt like a purgatory, but it was also this opportunity to let things, like a crucible, to let things kind of melt. And I was determined that whatever I did in the rest of my life would really fulfill my sense of meaning and purpose. But what was that? That was the question I asked. And so I spent years basically trying to figure out these concepts that we just take around us, whether it's um, big ideas like God or soul or meaning itself or humanity or nature or all these things, what were they? And I began to try to look th through history as to where these ideas evolved from and then realized that other cultures had very different ways of understanding and started to look at science and neuroscience and cognitive science and anthropology to understand where humans got these ideas from in the first place. And all that led me to end up at some point going, you know, it'd be really great if somebody could write a, if I'd come across a book that actually helped me to sort out all these things. And I realized, well, let me go ahead and do that. It's like I was putting this sort of jigsaw puzzle together, all the different pieces. So that was this earlier book, The Patterning Instinct, which is this history of humanity's search for meaning. But perhaps most important for me um, was that this search actually did yield something. Uh, and I realized I, I, I came across a sense of deep meaning and purpose in life. I got to understand how meaning itself was this function of connectedness and how we live in our modern society according to a worldview that we take as reality that is plain wrong. Um, it's scientifically invalid, even though we think that it's based on science. Um, and I realized that there's another way of looking at things where traditional wisdom can truly uh, point us to the, some of the same insights that modern science also points us to. And that's what this current book, The Web of Meaning, is about. Oh, I absolutely love that. And so on. I'm so sorry for, for your loss and that you had to go through those hard times. It seems mm -hmm. like it, it takes that for humanity to kind of get a wake up call to kind of say, Hey, some, something's wrong. What's, what's the meaning of life? What's the purpose? You know, um, um, this, this whole pandemic time has been a huge wake up call for, for many people to say, Hey, our, our systems, our civilization frameworks that we're operating on, they're just not working for us all anymore. And, um, and there's this dis-ease or discomfort around the world of, of, of you know, people exiting and, and, and traveling and moving and trying to find new meanings and, and, and travel or different places around the world where they're just saying, hey, this, this, where I live, where this structure is, where I was born, is just this system's not working for me anymore. And, and so, I, I hope... <laughs> Many of them aren't, aren't as tragic as what you had to go through, but the pandemic was pretty bad for many people. And I think it was also a big wake up call that our, our infrastructures, our systems that we live in are just not working for us all anymore. They're not in harmony with the world or nature. And, and so I love that. I, uh, I, I totally agree with George Monboy and what he said uh, and um, many of the other accolades that you have in the in the book and re, in reviews um i would almost have to say beyond a decade i would have to say a century i'm not a century old obviously but 51 years old i would have to say this is the best book i have read and and you know the last 40 years um, that brings it all together. And my, my question really is, is 
I, I've had that same experience and that same feeling that you had. Where is the one history lesson or teacher or book out there that kind of puts all this complexity, all this science, all this big history together into one spot and gives us the state that, that humanity is living in and dealing with, and whether it's global citizen or New Yorker or someone from China, that, yeah. that we're kind of all, all, all living in this crazy, crazy world that we've, we've set up for each other. And I just haven't been able to find them. I've, and the, the thing about your book, which, which was really fabulous is all the individual books that I read that says, okay, here's one facet or two facets right. of this complex system. Joseph Campbell, Lynn Margulis, Peter Singer, Stefano Mancuso, or right. many of the other great authors or writers that you, that, that you've mm -hmm. re referenced in, in your book. And you say, okay, they talk about this and this is the big history. Here's the story. But you put it all together in one book, you reference it. So if we want to know more, we can go check it out there. But it's this big systems perspective of this true web of meaning. Besides mm. all those individual books, ha, did you run across any individual book out there that says that you'd say, wow, that was came very close? Frick Hove Capra, and I, I'm a Capra graduate. You, you he right. does the four word and patterning instincts and and yeah. you're, you've connected with him in many different ways. Um, I would say probably he comes the closest, especially with his, his last book, The Patterns of Connection was his last book, is probably yeah. the closest mm -hmm. book that I can think of. But other than that, is there any any other sources out there that you said, boy, that comes really close or thought uh, w wisdoms out there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, it Definitely, if you hadn't mentioned Fritjof Capra, I would have said that probably, yeah, he he was one of the um, writers who I came across who really pulled it together for me. It was really early in that sort of project, that multi-year project I was talking about that I came across his work. In, initially, it was just, I was really kind of didn't even know where to begin, but somewhere in my memory, I knew there was this great book called The Tao of Physics that had been written years ago that looked really cool. So I think, let me and make that one of my entry points, which I really enjoyed. And that's somewhat dated now after um, 50 years, but a great trailblazing uh, work of its time. Um, but then I came across some of his books from uh, some decades back, like The Web of Life, uh, <clears throat> for example, um, and The Turning Point, which, talks about the systems view of life. And what's so kind of funny when I look back on it is I was reading this book of his and really getting a sense of, wow, this is opening my mind. And then I came across this chapter called the systems view of life or whatever it was called. And I was, this looks really boring systems view. I don't even, I'm not sure I would want to read this chapter. Um, so I wonder if I can skip it, but I figured, let me just read it anyway. It opened my whole life up to a completely different way of making sense of things. But it's got such a, I always think systems thinking has a, um, a bad, like a marketing problem uh, in the sense that it just sounds, for somebody who's not into it, it sounds so boring. Why do I want to think about systems? What's so interesting about that? And of course, um, for those of who do, who have entered into it, it opens up a whole different way of looking at, at different, at the connectedness of all aspects of life that's profound. But other people, there there have been some great writers. There have been so many um, that it's hard to even um, list them. One uh, writer who really pulled a lot of things together for me in a very profound way is um, a philosopher of biology called Evan Thompson, um, who wrote a, a, a deep uh, book called Mind in Life. Um, and it's philosophical and it's it's kind of hard slogging for and, and let, if people who are not used to that kind of thing. But it was a brilliant book that showed mm -hmm. some of the deeper connections that I really tried to make a little bit more easy to access whatever in my book, The Web of Meaning, like recognizing these deep interpenetration between these big concepts of life and mind and systems thinking and also Buddhist thoughts. And he is one of the leading thinkers who looks at how 
Buddhism and systems orientation and life-based biology intersect. So, and there's others like that, but honestly, there's nobody that I've come across who's really um, done this kind of, uh, tried to really encompass basically everything in, um, in this overall view, which is why I call it the web of meaning um, as the title of the book, because basically I don't view myself as having um, you know, a, a great number of great insights of my own, like having done my research in this area, and I need to tell the world, this is what this is about. That's what, but, uh, what I really view my own role and what hopefully I have some skill in is looking at these great insights from so many different brilliant researchers and people in different fields, whether it's systems thinking, evolutionary biology, or um, a deep analysis of wisdom traditions, whatever they might be, and weaving together um, these the elements about them that show how they relate to each other, not to sort of create some overall kind of mishmash of um, to sort of a, a lowest common denominator, but sort of the opposite by showing how one area enlightens our ability to really understand at a, at a greater level another area. And, we, and to really open this recognition that so many people in so many fields around the world are actually working together in this kind of more connected, uh, to create, to flesh out this more connected worldview and potentially offer a pathway for humanity that could be so much better into the future. Yeah, and I, I, I it, uh, I thank you for the, the the recommends of the books, and that I, I just want the listeners to know that just the few that I mentioned. I mean, there's James Lovelock. There's you know, there's um, so many people that you uh, mentioned throughout the book, and and their wisdoms and writings that uh, I I think is probably the most complete. I don't know if compendium is the right word, compilation of, of this web of meaning and different thoughts and how we got to certain places and how we think those. In, in all my podcasts, I always ask all my guests, and I've done this for several years, I ask them a couple of questions. I ask them the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, although this pandemic time, we've probably been uh, thinking it quite a bit. It's actually, what's the futures, you know, plural, <laughs> what's the futures? Um, and then the other one is, what does a world that works for everyone look like for, for you? They're kind of very, very similar questions, because if we don't know what the future is, we don't know what the goal or the journey or the path is or what the meaning is, uh, it's most likely we're not working to get there, but we also will we'll never reach that because we don't have a clear path or, or, or way to get there and, 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 and to view the world. And eventually we, we hit a point in, in our lives, some, all of us, where we get that wake up call one way or the other, where we start to ask ourselves those questions and, and <clears throat> whether that's the right time for us or not, uh, you know, that the reason I ask those questions is because we don't learn this in school. I don't, are, are, are there schools out there? Are there schools of thoughts or places in this world where um, you get this operating manual for spaceship earth, kind of like our Buck Minister Fuller, where you can go and say, okay, this kind of gives you all the help and, and insight. Is there such a thing? Or um, is this kind of the human condition that we have to, be in search of, of these, these, these questions. Yeah, well, um, it would be wonderful if this were the, the kind of standard uh, graduate level course that was offered around the world. But I mean, to my knowledge, there's a couple of places that I think are attempting to offer something like this. Um, uh, one is actually here in the Bay Area where I live. There's um, a CIIS, a Center for, and Center for Integral Studies, um, which tries to offer something like that, tries to look, it's called integral studies, it tries to integrate um, different layers, um, tying in religion with science, with studies of consciousness, uh, with ecological awareness, um, which, I, and, and you know, um, it's a big task, but I, I think they, they really are trying to offer that kind of scope. In the UK, there's 
Schumacher College, which um, is similarly um, offers graduate courses in something approaching this kind of more integrated way of looking at our world, but they're few and far between, and we need a lot more of them without doubt. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, they're, they're not there. And <clears throat> that's kind of also why I began this search is because a lot of the things that we learn, and I've heard you talk about it, not only in your book, but offline, you do some pretty good speeches and talks about your books and, and uh, how, how to kind of make sense of certain things and how, how these um, patterns of uh, instinct kind of develop is really asking the questions and, and diving into where how they evolved and that you say a lot of them are wrong these are these are things that we learn through life that are the way the world works but they're absolutely false yeah. and um, the the biggest one is and and you talk about it in the book and, and I want to talk to you about it now and it's basically that there's this kind of a Darwin uh, misunderstanding that natural mm -hmm. selection, survival of the fittest, severe competition, only the strong survive type yeah. of mentality that's worked its way into corporations, into our, our civilization frameworks where we we're in this competition and marketing and fight with each other and struggle in this this battle with each other to be successful and, and to, to make, make our way in the world. But that's absolutely not how the world works. It's uh, that's neoliberalism. That's neo-Darwinism. And it's, it doesn't, our world doesn't work that way. And, and, and uh, Lynn Margulis is the, and also through uh, Frithof uh, Capra is how I came to Lynn Margulis and all her work and, and with Dorian Sagan, her, her son, and she was the right. first wife of, of Carl Sagan. Just the wonderful things that we learned through there, that that's not how the world works. And so um, I, I kind of would like to get that connection for, from you and to explain it a little bit more to us, all these misnomers yeah. or these fallacies. <clears throat> Absolutely. And I, I think that's so, so critical. And, and we were talking before about, I was talking about my own journey. And um, when I look back on the first years of, of that intellectual journey I was taking, this is exactly where I was kind of, what I was stuck with, because I was determined in, in my own search for meaning that whatever um, place of meaning I came to, would I could truly, um, would be truly integrated in the sense that I wasn't going to take somebody else's word for it. And I had to really believe it in my brain. It had to make sense to my heart, my heart, mind, my, my being. But also, I wasn't going to just take some woo-woo, um, oh, trust me, this is, this is all nice and make you feel good. That wasn't going to work for me. So I was looking at the hard science, and, and surely these leading scientists can tell us where it's all about. And of course, just like I came across Fritjof Capra very early on, I came across Richard Dawkins very early on. And, oh, the selfish gene, the, he's, and everyone respects this guy. So let me figure out how um, biology works through reading this. And, you know, his message was bracing. And um, as I read this book, which basically says that, you know, we are just kind of these machines dominated by our selfish genes and evolution works that each gene um, is as selfish as possible and outcompetes the other. And that's the beauty of evolution. And, and that's just the way it is. And, and where I was at at that point was, well, if this is true, then I'll have to work with it. But it didn't make sense to my own core feeling tone about life. But I was going to go where the science led me, if you will. Um, and then along with that is this kind of ontological reductionism, when you, um, which is similar to Dawkins type thinking, saying ultimately the universe itself is meaningless. It's just a bunch of billiard balls hitting each other. And it's, it's, that's, that's what it's about. And so don't look for meaning. If you're going to look for some sense of meaning in the universe, then you're just going to kid yourself. Like, you know, but if you really want to take, know what's true, just accept what science tells you. I was ready to do that. Um, yeah, but then I discovered that all that stuff is plain wrong. Um, so in terms of Richard Dawkins and the selfish gene, like as you mentioned, I came across Lynn Margulis 
and her work and, and got to understand that actually uh, it's fundamentally different from what Dawkins says. For starters, the gene itself doesn't <clears throat> actually direct evolution the way we're told. Um, what we now know from recent decades in cellular biology and evolutionary biology is that actually it's um, this evolution itself is a complex system. Um, and as a complex system, what that means is that there's feedback effects. So while the gene um, uh, actually, yes, it, it's, it carries a lot of information that affects how the organism is. The organism itself or the cell in which the gene exists actually determines what parts of the gene to express, what to turn on and off. So there's this feedback flow, nothing, and it's not about the gene telling everything what it, what it should be. That's the, that's the first flaw in that um, understanding that's common knowledge at this point or common lack of knowledge or whatever, a common ignorance, if you will. Um, but the second one is that when people look at the timeline of evolution from when uh, life first began on Earth uh, just over four billion years ago to now, there's been like maybe just a few, maybe four or five major steps in the increase in complexity of life that's led in the last few hundred million years to this incredible abundant world we live in today filled with rich ecosystems and all the <clears throat> miraculous um, beauty of everything we see around us. Each of those steps in the increase of complexity of life came about not from competition, but actually from different species, different organisms learning how to cooperate with each other in a process that's known as mutually beneficial symbiosis, where two different organisms essentially get together and say, I'm good at this, you're good at that. Now, if I try to outcompete you, um, then that's not gonna last very well. But if I actually can offer you something that will be really good for you, and you can offer something that will be really good for me, then it's like a positive sum game. And then we're all benefit. And life discovered this in different layers, all the way from cells learning how to become more complex to multicellular organisms, to um, uh, animals, to uh, the in co collective intelligences like ant colonies, whatever, all the way to humans. Every one of these steps is about cooperation. So this notion of the competitive gene is fundamentally flawed, but so few people know about it right now. That is so amazing. And I, I try to speak, I've been speaking about Lynn and, and uh, Chris Wolf and, and the symbiosis for a long time. And people are like, what symbiotic earth, symbiosis, what are you talking yeah. about? Mycorrhiza, my, right. uh, you know, all, all these things that are like, what is it? How does it work? Our human health, us, you and I, our health is um, as a microcosmos of the world around us, this indigenous microorganisms about wherever we move ourselves around in this earth, uh, our health is really tied closely to that, the health of our, our planet and this microcosmos around us. And it's, it's so interesting that, you know, Lynn's first husband, Carl Sagan, he said, you know, we're all star stuff and the basic right. elements of life, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen they're all you know uh the basic elements of life that are in our body that make up the human body but they also make up our planet that's how our planet started and formed and emerged into a planet and then the actual first life to spring up out of our planet was these microorganisms and uh, yeah. you know and bacteria basically that went from a single cell to a nucleated cell and the plants and involved and right. eventually we crawled out of this primordial soup right um we are of this earth we are the star star dust the star stuff that that our planet's made up of we're, we weren't dropped off from planet germany or planet usa right. or china or whatever we we actually crawled out of this uh this Gaia, this mother earth. And of course, we, you know, we were born from our mothers and that, but the beginnings re really started with these bacteria. And this, this is a lot of what Lynn's work was, was based on was this microcosmos. And it's just, to me, it's always so fascinating to say, you know, Carl Sagan did the cosmos show and he talked about these big things, you know, that, that we were made in the interiors of collapsing stars and, and all these the basic elements of life and 
and, and that. And then Lynn talked about the microcosmos and kind of dispelled. There was a lot of controversy between her and Dawkins uh, and other scientists yeah. where she kind of disrupted the whole thing. She says, you guys are wrong. This is and there is no neoliberalism, neo-Darwinism. There is no natural selection, survival of the fittest, this selfish gene like like you guys are talking about. And they thought she was crazy or heretic. Yes. So, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, she for decades of her life, she was frozen out of uh, sort of mainstream thinking. And it's one of those stories, like here's this woman coming up with a different way of looking at things and just totally discarded. Uh, by mainstream society. And then now decades later, and um, everything she says is orthodoxy. And um, it's, it's not even, there's no controversy left about her very notion that basically um, the nucleated cell, which um, basically essentially is everything other than bacteria, everything we see around us is created by uh, cells with a nucleus actually arose from this thing called endosymbiosis where one tiny little cell that was really good at energy production got consumed by another cell. And rather than just being eaten and digested, they figured out how to do this symbiosis together. So every one of our cells um, contains in it a, 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 a mitochondrion, or actually many mitochondria, um, which come from a completely different lineage, but they worked out how to live together. And, and in fact, uh, you know, what we, what we find is the indigenous insight, which is and many indigenous uh, groups around the world throughout history have seen all of life as our relatives. And, and they actually talk about the animals and the trees as our relatives, like that we're one big extended family. They're absolutely right. What modern biology actually now understands is that we share like about half of our genes with a fruit fly. Um, and we share about 40% of our genes with a banana. And um, it's like we, rather than these things being like separate from us, we actually all come from the same, that same source of life itself. And in fact, we can really begin to see life rather than a thing, like um, some sort of, or just some concept as really an unfolding process. It's almost like this, you can sort of imagine like a series of waterfalls going over time over billions of years. And, and each of us are just little eddies within some overall grand process of life unfolding on this earth that it has done for billions of years, it will do for billions of years into the future. And that helps to look at a very different context of what we are actually about in our lives. Yeah, it's it, it's a it, it, it's so beautiful how how it works. And when it's it's like this light bulb goes on when you read Lynn's books, when you read about her work, mm -hmm. when you read about uh, the things that Carl Sagan talked about, or any of those that you discuss in your book. Um, this light goes on and it just, it makes sense. And you can see it in 2015, I believe it was, we didn't, until that point, we didn't even discover a whole branch of the bacteria tree of life, you know? So this bacteria, right. bacteria tree of life, there was this whole um, section. And most of that section was the, the, microbiome of our body our gut health and 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 the bacteria that lives in our body that is so integral integrally co connected to the beginnings of life of our planet and and we're you know people are saying now hey your, your gut health or your your uh, good microbiome in your stomach and and that that's like your second brain is what they're calling it and it that's right. controls yeah. a lot of things and and when we make those connections and we see how that we're like wow uh, how 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 vital is that i mean we hurt our our nature and our atmosphere and our environment around us with chemicals pesticides pesticides fertilizers air pollution you know automotive pollution uh, fossil fuels um that puts chemicals and, and things in the air that really affect that microbiome not only of our earth but our our own microbiome and it weakens our immunity it weakens our gut health it weakens our uh, ability to to get through these pandemics to have that resilience that regeneration and kind of live in this symbiosis because 
and, and, and this is what I love to go back to, to, to Fritzhoff a lot is, is this systems view of life is that everything's made up of complex systems and systems of systems. And there are so right. many multiple facets and complexities, but that's how the world works. Our body's made up of 11 systems, uh, digestive, skeletal, right. neural uh, uh, systems. And if one of them fails, um, the other 10 compensate to kind of recoup for that, right? Um, right. That, but there's not one of those 11 systems that controls the other 10. They right. all work gooey in exactly. harmony together. And it's too, for too, too long, we've kind of taken this siloed linear approach at solving our global grand challenges or, yeah. or life. And we say, okay, no, all I have to do is worry about breathing today. No, you're, you're functioning on thousands of different systems. Every single, they work autonomously. You're very adept at dealing with systems thinking and complexity. You just need to understand how that connects to the rest of nature and life and the symbiosis. Right. And those are the things that just in, in your book, you bring them out so nicely and you connect them and you, 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 you talk about how, how that works. I just absolutely love it. Um, mm. my, my biggest question is what is your, your biggest hope with this book that you, you want to achieve and you want to give to people? Is it to, to educate them, to give them a big view of history or to, of, of the web of meaning? Well, I, my biggest hope really is a pretty large one, which is to really help to lay the foundations for a fundamentally different worldview that could lead us to a, a, a absolutely different future for humanity on this earth. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty big vision uh, to uh, hope that a, a book can do. But basically, we've been living for the last few hundred years according to this particular paradigm, like this worldview of disconnection. And um, it's a worldview that has um, led to all kinds of positive things, uh, such as the development of science and um, just incredible <clears throat> improvements in many elements of the human experience, improvements in understanding of hygiene um, and uh, improvements in technology, whereby you and I can speak to each other from thousands of miles away, thanks to what science has brought to us. All kinds of positive things has risen from it. So this is not to disparage elements of our worldview, but it's been a worldview of disconnection that is driving our society right now to our civilization toward a precipice and driving many of us in our own lived experience to a place of isolation, alienation, and a sense of meaninglessness in our own lives. Um, and we, we absolutely have to shift the direction of where we're going. And my hope for this book is that it lays a very solid, intellectually rigorous, coherent foundation for this different worldview of interconnectedness, that if enough critical mass of people can begin to absorb and start to instill into their own lives, we actually still have the possibility of shifting humanity's trajectory. Oh, I love it. That's music to my ears. Uh, so wonderful that, that that's what you wanna do. And that's uh, exactly how, how I see it, that, um, we can really reach this critical mass and make that shift, but we don't have this knowledge. Sorry, my my light keeps turning off here. Um, but yeah, we, we just need to shift our our view on life and, and figure out how we can um, reach that critical mass to, to get to that point where we are more part of this symbiotic earth and more part of the solution and working together with nature and using a lot of this um, indigenous wisdom and different ways of thinking. And a lot of that has to do with some of the models that we, we use. And, and 
I, wa I wanted to discuss with you because pattern patterning uh, instincts uh, talks about it quite a bit religions and different sections of civilization frameworks and things, but also the web of meaning um, goes through different models that we've had at different points or, or views in our in our life, and it's just crazy that we're taking so long to, to figure it out. And, and the question is, my understanding of big history, and I'm sure you've researched it in, in both of your books quite a bit, is that all these civilization frameworks that we've had, they've all collapsed, you know, early antiquity, Mesopotamia, Incas, Aztec, Mayas, the Greeks, yeah. and Romans, on and on. Uh, and the majority of them collapsed because of ecological or environmental collapse. Um, a couple collapsed because of displacement or conflict or something like this. But the next thing is, is they all operated on this same structure, the same hierarchy structure model. It wasn't a symbiotic type of structure. It wasn't regenerative. It wasn't kind of, you know, what we'd call today circular economy, donut economy. Uh, you, you mentioned Kate Rowworth in, in, in your yeah. books and in, in your works uh, quite a bit. So how, how, how does that work, these civilization frameworks that are, are we living this human condition that we just continue to repeat the same models over and over and over again, uh, hoping for different results, or we're not getting that big history lesson of what failed in the past, you know, I, I'm not understanding why that's occurring. Yeah, well, that's a fascinating topic in itself is like how do civilizations evolve and how do they collapse and why do they collapse and um in my mind the person who's done the best research on that is um, an academic called joseph tainter like an anthropologist i believe um in is his actual discipline but he wrote a book called the collapse of complex civilizations he spent decades really researching as well and i think he came up with a really uh clear um, kind of principle of what happens with civilizations. A lot of them, yes, they uh, they overshoot their ecological footprints and all that stuff. But he kind of went deeper than that. And he showed that basically what they do is um, they continue to invest in complexity. And as a civilization, and, and it, different civilizations can sort of uh, find ways to uh, basically bring in their energy sources in different ways. Like the Romans, for example, found the conquest work, conquer another country, take the slaves, take their raw materials and keep doing that. Um, uh, our civilization obviously does that with fossil fuels and through technology. But in all these different cases, there's a certain point at which the investment in that extra complexity um, only yields and diminishing returns. And then you begin to find yourself having to run faster and faster and faster just to maintain, and then even faster, and you're still going down. And that's, of course, when um, the society itself begins to crumble because people are uh, unsatisfied. They, they might have been accepting something where there was inequalities, but it was uh, it was some improvement going on, but then things start falling apart. And it's like, generally what happens is civilizations hollow themselves out. So by the time the collapse happens, we might look back historically and say, oh, that's the thing collapsed. But it, there was almost a non-event because there's very little left. Um, you know, once the, there's this, the sack of Rome or whatever, that was almost like an afterthought. Rome had already collapsed uh, decades earlier in terms of the actual infrastructure. So we're seeing this with our civilization and similarly, where we are aware that fossil fuels are causing climate breakdown. And yet here are these fossil fuel companies going to the um, deep under the ocean or going to the tar sands in Canada or um, like f doing fracking to like, like explode underground these massive, like cause of these massive earthquakes just to get methane out of the earth to all this crazy stuff. Um, when we're actually knowing that we're, we can't afford to do that. So that, that could lead to a sense of inevitability uh, in terms of, oh, well, uh, here we go again, nothing to do but sort of put your seatbelt on and just go for the ride and hope you make it out in one piece or whatever. But I think that there's more, um, more to it than that. 
Because what we need to realize is that there are different alternatives to where our civilization is going to go. Um, and really, to your WTF question that you, you had earlier, it seems to kind of lead to that, like what's what are the futures or whatever. Um, I, and my own view is I actually see, well, well, for starters, I think one thing we can be clear about is that this century, we are going to undergo some kind of phase transition um, that will be massive. And that's, we can talk about it in terms of like collapse of civilization or whatever, but there's going to be a, a civilizational change that will be basically as large as just there's only been two or three major phase transitions in human history um, that it can be compared to. Like when nomadic hunter-gatherers uh, <clears throat> began to settle down and, and sedentism and agriculture arose about 10 to 12,000 years ago. That was one of the greatest changes in all of human history. And then a second change like that happened with the scientific revolution in Europe in the 17th century, when this, these kind of agrarian civilizations gave way to the modern world dominated by, um, by science, also by capitalism and, and imperialism from European powers, et cetera. And we are going to experience something as big um, this century where all the different aspects of the human experience are going to be different um, fundamentally. Um, that's pretty much everyone who looks at this situation recognizes that. It's not going to be just this linear, um, you know, uh, more of the same three, four, five decades from now. The question is, what is this change going to lead to? And I see three potential scenarios, which roughly summarize uh, where the only directions I see that are, are kind of possible. One is um, just plain out and out collapse, just like we've been kind of leaning towards that. We have this growth-based society, um, it stops working. We have climate breakdown, ecological breakdown, um, massive famines, uh, absolute societal breakdown, billions of climate refugees, um, things just start falling apart. People can't get their food in cities um, and basically things crumble. Um, and that's an absolute disastrous scenario where we'd be looking at billions of people losing their lives in a horrendous way. Um, and it's, it's a scenario that sometimes people will be almost cynical about it. Well, maybe it's just, you know, maybe this has to happen and we can just start again or whatever. No, this, is, this would be an absolute, the greatest tragedy, the greatest cataclysm in all of human history. And it's to be avoided at all costs if there's any way to avoid it. But then there's this other scenario that's not too dissimilar from that, um, which I believe many of the global elites uh, actually um, think is going to happen and are planning for, which you might call like the gilded lifeboat scenario or the fortress earth scenario, depending on uh, your point, which is that basically these are the elites who are looking at what's going on and saying, yeah, it's going to be collapse and all these uh, country, all these billions of people are going to suffer from all this stuff. But, you know, we can uh, fence ourselves off from that. Um, we can use our money and use uh, technology and military force um, to uh, create this kind of uh, fortress, basically. But we can do all these cool things and um, develop technology and find ways to communicate with each other, become like basically cyborgs and maybe even genetically evolve ourselves to be and it's like transhumans and all that stuff. And so if other if most of humanity dies, well, that's too bad. But look at this singularity, this op this um, future that offers itself to us. I believe that implicitly, even though they might not even admit it to themselves, a lot of the wealthy elites in the world are kind of leaning towards that as the scenario that gives them the, uh, the future, them and their children, the future that they think is possible, which is really explains why these elites are not like doing what Greta Thunberg asked them to do. They're not running around saying the house is on fire because they're saying, actually, I've got a bunker down in the basement, it's totally fine. So you can burn up there, but I'm gonna be fine. So that's the second scenario. I call it techno split um, in uh, my writings. And, and that scenario in my mind is, morally even more egregious than the first scenario. The first scenario is bad enough, but this scenario is like equivalent to the Titanic 
um, sinking and the wealthy people getting on this gilded lifeboat and people scrambling to get on board and then just kicking them on their knuckles as they're trying to clamber up, saying it's good for us, but too bad for you. I think that is an absolute a moral crime that we need to be aware of. And anyone who is somewhat awakened to what's going on needs to recognize this is happening and we need to stop that. So what other alternatives are there? That's well, very I do dystopian. Think... The second one is so dystopian. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, hmm. yeah, we're uh, humanity, even if it's the elites, uh, still survive, but they're wearing spacesuits. They're living in bunkers. I mean, what kind of a life is that? I mean, a uh, life of misery surrounded by money that's useless or bunkers. That's, that's, not, that's not a very great future. Well, see, I think they see it a different way. I think they they probably see it in terms of um, gigantic sort of fenced off um, nature preserves where they have their, um, yeah, they, they, they find the areas, whether it's in New Zealand or Canada or um, wherever, Siberia, where um, as things totally fall apart, there are going to be sun temperate areas left in the world. And they figure if they've got enough wealth and power, they can um, fence off all the suffering and still continue to actually have their version of a, of a good life. Um, so I think that that's my sense of what they're kind of um, secretly figuring is the way out of this current scenario. So I view it more than anything as morally dystopian. It's the very worst features of this kind of selfish, greed-driven, Gordon Gecko, greed is good type of mentality, actually becoming a worldview, becoming like the future of humanity. I think we need to uh, move, do everything to not let that happen. Um, but the first thing to do is to recognize it and talk about it explicitly um, in order to not go down that path. But I think there is another path and, and there's another possible future for, for humanity which actually could be very positive, but it involves, it involves a certain kind of collapse, not a collapse of civilization itself, but a collapse of this capitalist system that is driving us to this, these bifurcations, driving us to this completely unsustainable path, this notion of endless growth on a finite planet that we're on right now. And this, this path would be to actually move towards a civilization that some people, and I've, I've taken up this phrase myself because I love it, and some people call it an ecological civilization. Basically, I'm laying the groundwork for a civilization um, that's founded on a different basis, rather than one that's based on um, wealth accumulation, exploitation, and extraction, one that's actually built on life-affirming principles, built on the same conditions that allow ecosystems to thrive for millions of years uh, sustainably and in, in great health. And, and a civilization that actually starts off by setting the conditions for all humans to be able to flourish on a regenerative and on regenerated earth. That's the notion of what an ecological civilization is. And it's not only possible, but it's actually, um, it's being done in certain um, small places around the world right now. People are, are living according to those principles of an ecological civilization. And it's, it's, it's absolutely available to us. The technology and the economics and the education systems are all available to us to actually have that kind of civilization. And the real, uh, I mean, there's two sort of major um, conundrums we need to get through to get to that place. One is for enough people to realize what's possible and actually start to shift their lives according to it. And the other, maybe equally difficult, is to actually build that life-affirming civilization within the current civilization. So as the current uh, global civilization collapses, rather than it leading to this complete downfall of everything we know, the other civilization has already like begun to grow within it. So the collapse of that prior civilization becomes more like um, sort of shedding off a skin um, rather than everything um, falling in and disintegrating. I, I'm a big uh, student or fan of Herman Daly, one of the first ecological economists, also Keith uh, Boulding, um, right. who also did a lot around, around e ecological economics. Um, 
there's many more. I've had some on the podcast. Tim Jackson's a great ecological economist. Yeah. You know, Kate Roworth, you've spoken about right. uh, Mariana mm-hmm. Mazzucato, Mission Economics. We've heard the terms circular economy, donut eco- economics. We've heard now with Dr. Johan Rockstrom, planetary boundaries, which is right. kind of is, is, is very similar to Kate Raworth's donut economics. And I think they kind of work together, but it's also a, a, a way of, uh, of looking at this ecological way to live within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries in harmony, in this symbiosis. And I, I absolutely love that that's, that's the direction. And so um, even though you've probably touched on, upon it before, I, I would like you to answer the question, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Is it this ecological civilization or is there a little bit more for that? Um, well, it is that ecological civilization. And, and uh, it might be helpful to kind of flesh it out um, a little bit more so people can get a sense of what we're talking about. So we talked a little bit about just those principles of life affirming principles. Um, but basically what that ecological civilization would look like um, would be one which is based on this principle of mutually beneficial symbiosis that we've described has what been what life itself has discovered works best um, in evolutionary terms, which is like different groups or different species or organisms realizing that the best way to actually work sustainably is to find out ways of relating to others which work for both, which is not, a, not in a zero sum game. And it's also based on this concept you were touching on before um, that I I call fractal flourishing. And you were talking about how we realize that what's good for us um, is not like that it's um, if we cause harm to our environment, ultimately that's bad for us. Or if we um, are doing well in a society, but it's causing our society itself to be disintegrating, that ends up being bad for us. The notion of fractal flourishing recognizes that in human society, just like in ecosystems, um, we all live embedded in this, what's called a holarchy, that every system is a part of a bigger system. It's autonomous within itself, but is also part of a bigger system, which is part of a bigger system. So for us, you know, we have each, um, each cell is a complete system, which is p- then part of an, an organ or an, a, a part of another system within our body, which is part of our own bodies, which is then part of our um, system of family and community, um, which is also part of, the, um, of our region. Um, and ultimately it goes all the way to Gaia. We're all part of that global system. And once we realize that, we realize that fractal flourishing is this principle that we need to find ways that we can flourish that causes each of these layers in the system to also flourish. In just the same way that if I'm doing something in my body that's really bad for my legs and and sort of causes me to um, harm um, my leg, for example, um, then that's going to hurt other systems in my body. Then I can't ambulate as well. And so that'll cause me to be sluggish. My cardiovascular system will get um, start to struggle. And like, maybe I'll get overweight and all these kinds of things will happen. My whole system um, relies on the other systems. So when we apply that to human society, well, it leads to very basic things. First off, it leads to this um, recognition um, that we need to set the foundations for human dignity, all of the things that Kate Rayworth talked about in Donut Economics, the um, the lower part of the donut, which relates to the basic conditions for true individual dignity and flourishing. Everything from um, ensuring that there is uh, an, an not, each person has access to enough food, and um, housing, uh, physical security, education, um, uh, all of the different like healthcare, all the different levels that lead to a basic life, that should be the foundational um, concept within a society, what a society is founded on. And all this done within those Rockstrom boundaries of those planetary boundaries that you were talking about, done in a sustainable way. That in itself um, is a huge challenge because right now there's not a single country that actually is able to offer those basics within anything even close to sustainability. 
but it's shown that that is, that is doable. We have to move away from these incredible inequalities that we have right now. That's one of the foundational um, ways in which our current system would be different. And we'd move away from these mega billionaires. There'd be a cap on the amount of wealth that a single person can accumulate based on this recognition that the vast amount of wealth that we have on this earth is actually um, belongs to all of us, is a commonwealth that, you know, we, you, we believe in normal mainstream thinking that, well, if some Mark Zuckerberg type person or Jeff Bezos um, becomes a centibillionaire or whatever, well, they must have deserved it because like, look what the value they've added to people. Bullshit. No, they haven't. Basically, um, what they've done is added one tiny little tip on top of this accumulated mountain of wonderful, miraculous brilliance that humans over multiple generations, centuries and millennia have worked together to create for our global society. That's what we can think of as the common wealth. And once we realize that, we realize there should be a cap on what those uh, individuals can earn. And similarly, there should be a universal basic income that um, rather than these, these excessive wealth going to like a few people, there should be basically, a, um, simply by being alive, a person has the right as a human being to enough income to be able to afford those basics in life so that they can spend their time actually exploring what they want to do that's truly meaningful with their life. And contrary to what people believe, again, according to our mainstream thinking, when people actually get access to this um, universal basic income um, that is unconditional, um, they don't actually, you know, just go and waste it on drinking and drugs and get lazy and all this stuff. Quite the contrary. It actually leads to a reduction in those negative behaviors and people invest in what's really meaningful to them. They invest in community work. They invest in working for their family. They invest in entrepreneurial activities that they've always wanted to do. And then they have the chance to do that. So these are just some of the basics. Uh, and I, I could go on talking about uh, reg significant restructuring of corporations, changes in education. There's every single aspect of what we take as a given in how our, our life works right now could be revamped based on this, this notion of deep interconnectedness of all of us together on, on the earth. I absolutely love it. It is uh, so good to hear you speak about this and, and to to get your vision of what a world that works for everyone looks like. So without me kind of spilling the beans or, or kind of releasing anything, basically this ecological civilization is a book in the coming possibly. <laughs> okay. Yes. Great. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm fine to, to talk about that. It's certainly not a, a secret from my perspective. Okay. Um, in fact, the book, the web of meaning, and that we've been talking about ends on this vision of an ecological civilization. Like if you go through the book and you begin to realize that there is this alternative worldview that's actually scientifically valid and actually brings in the great insights of different wisdom traditions of our, that founded on our deep interconnectedness, then it naturally leads to say, well, what would a civilization look like that was based on that? The answer is, that ecological civilization. So I give a little bit of a taster at the end of the book of what that might look like. And actually right now I'm working on uh, my next book. In a way, it's a bit like a trilogy in the sense that the patterning instinct looked historically like diagnosing the problem. Where do, how did we get to this place? The web of meaning sets the foundations for a different worldview. But this next book, and um, my working title is Future Flourishing and Pathways Toward an Ecological Civilization. And um, it's, it's like, shows like what is actually possible. Because you, you, you're probably well aware of that famous quote that sometimes is attributed to Slavov Zizek, sometimes to um, other people. But it's this notion that um, it's easier for most people to um, think about the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism, uh, which is really true because we all have this sense of these apocalyptic visions of everything collapsing but we're so used to our society being the way it is that we can't even conceive of a different form of human relationships rather than, well, we don't wanna go back to 
being, you know, um, agrarian civilization or those hunter gatherers, yeah, that's not feasible. C quite correct. We don't want to go back to that. But nobody has a sense of what's possible. But there is actually a very clear vision that, again, this is not my vision. So the vision of many different people um, in areas of economics and education and technology um, and agroecology all around doing their particular part of building this ecological civilization. So I'm, what I want to do with this book, similarly to what I did with the Web of Meaning, is tie these things in together, show how the research is and um, research being done, for example, in commons based technological developments, like, uh, um, for example, distributed autonomous organizations and things like that, using the internet for new ways of relating, how that relates to something like agroecology and how that relates to something like raising children to be more um, empathic and, and to not like just become part of a competitive system. And all these things relate to each other. Uh, and I hope I hope we stay in touch because I, ha as you know, we've talked offline. I have a lot of views on this. I've spoke to uh, Tim Jackson and many others, uh, economists and, and, and those out there about my ideas. I also believe that, that we need some form of, of universal basic income, but I call it a twist. I'd like to see us receive uh, uh, something that's just an inalienable right that through birth and, and until death that, that we're guaranteed as human beings to always have the basics, the necessities so that we can, uh, if we have worries, if we wanna be creative, it's not about the basic needs of how we live and security and health and food and, and the infrastructure that those things are taken care of so that we can truly make that uh, evolutionary leap to, to, to be more creative, to, to be more symbiotic with, with our planet. You uh, have also teased and tickled that you're, you're working on releasing some, some things here on the mighty networks uh, through uh, um, um, deep transformation to keep people right. together, connected, talking about these to to kind of get that wisdom and that knowledge that's out there, but also to connect people together in this, hopefully to reach the critical mass, but also to come together. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, or yeah. what that is and how, how that's coming along? Sure, absolutely. Thanks for, for asking that, Mark. And um, yeah, this is a, a work in process right now that I hope to actually initiate early in 2022, maybe by February. Um, and it's this notion, we've been talking a lot about self-organized networks, and a lot of people, uh, when, I'm, when I talk and when I've uh, given classes in ecological civilization or on the themes of the web of meaning, um, find themselves really getting so excited being with others, uh, sharing these ideas, realizing that they, they've a lot of people wake up to these ideas and then feel very isolated wherever they are because others around them just aren't even on the same page. And then you start wondering, well, am I like missing something or, but then you see other people sharing these ideas and you can build these ideas on what they're talking about. So um, people have been wanting to stay connected with each other. And, and as a result of that, I'm going to be initiating on this platform called Mighty Networks, an online uh, network for community building called Deep Transformation for anybody around the world who recognizes that we are in an unsustainable trajectory right now and recognize that we need the deep transformation for culture, civilization, and within ourselves to be able to move humanity to a better place. And for people to then connect with others who share those ideas, one partly just to nurture their own sense of well being and to feel part of a community, but then just as importantly to actually engage with others to build these ideas so that um, these ideas don't get created like lots of. Um, sort of little sparks of light, each of them uh, just kind of getting lost in the wilderness. But actually, by working with each other's ideas, we get to weave something far more effective, far more powerful. In fact, I would hope to even be able to share, um, as I'm working on this book on an ecological civilization, share the, the chapters or whatever within the network, get feedback from people. So the book itself can become part of a collaborative enterprise that we can co-create to really create that future together. 
Wow, that's beautiful. And I, I definitely would like a, a, an invitation uh, and would love to join when it's when, when you're that far along. Um, I'm excited to tell every, everyone and the listeners that you, you're going to be contributing a nice piece uh, um, to my book, Menu B, with a, a bunch of other famous people that we've talked about today as well that are, are thought leaders and, and, and uh, uh, menu B is about really global food reform and, and moving us into more of these regenerative um, economies, these ecological uh, civilizations like you discuss, and how can we uh, fix that? And as you write about in your book, food is a big part of, of, uh, of, of these collapses and about the co- problems and issues we have with with our, our civilization frameworks that are that are failing us today and creating a lot of human suffering and as well as environmental problems. Mm-hmm. And so I'm so honored and glad that you're going to participate with that and, and, and look forward to releasing the book the first quarter of, of this year. I definitely want to stay in touch and, and keep the dialogue going back and forth as you evolve with a new book. And as the new book comes out, I, I want to have you back on the show. But even before that time, uh, uh, engage with you and maybe do some follow ups and have, have another podcast and discussion. Before I, I let you go, I just have um, kind of three questions that are more or less for my listeners, kind of a sustainable takeaway uh, for them. Um, and, and basically, it is um, if you were to have one or two messages as a sustainable takeaway for, for my listeners that had the power to change their life or to shift their paradigm, what would it be? Your message? Well, yeah, thank you. Um, basically, I think it would be fundamentally <clears throat> that the future is not like some spectator sport. It's not something that is happening out there. The future is actually something that we are co-creating. It's a process basically that each of us is part of. And even more than that, the future that we want is something that we can live into every day of our lives. It's not like, um, oh, you know, and that's something that's happening in some future time and we've got to work hard to try to make that happen. Actually, every day we get to live into that emerging future that we want. And it can be, it can feel sometimes, and I certainly feel it when I look at the news, when I look at what's going on in the world around us, it can be very easy to move towards a sense of despair, a sense that everything seems to be going in the wrong direction. Um, and I do feel that that there's a lot of truth in that, um, in where we are headed right now. But fundamentally, we need to recognize that the future is nonlinear. And just like every other complex system, it, it goes through the most unexpected moves. And we never know what it is that which each actions each of us is taking is actually making those moves, those directions happen. So that's the way in which we can live into each day with, with a sense of faith, this, a recognition that we're not doing this based on being attached to some outcome but we're doing this because this is what life is calling from us right now as we're looking at the world the way it is. So you reached a pretty hard point in your life with uh, what you were going through with, with your wife and, and uh, for other people who are in similar situations where they're like, whether it's the pandemic or they're just saying, hey, this world's not working for me anymore. And, lost and hopeless and and that they're looking for these not only what i recommend they 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 give the book but what what are some really important things for you or learning lessons that you had that helped you weather that time to help you get through and and i i i i take away that you're even though that tragedy you're still optimistic you're hopeful you have a vision of of where we could go Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think maybe the most important um, treasure that I came across in my own path, and as you said, I did go through in some incredibly difficult times, um, uh, it was a very simple concept. It's one that's available to all of us and simply kindness. And it's the recognition that 
and as we're suffering and we go through we all these parts within ourselves that we feel a, a bad or wrong or difficult and 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 we can get caught up in all this stuff so we always have the opportunity to turn to those parts within ourselves with kindness and once we begin to establish that practice within our own parts then it begins to be second nature to then offer it to others around us and when we see people that doing things whether it's people close to us or people on the political um, other side of the spectrum we see as enemies, when we see them doing things we don't like, that we can actually um, have the ability to go to a deeper layer of compassionate connection and recognize that even when they're doing stuff to get us angry, we know we can recognize this every single human being has that soft beating heart that really ultimately wants love and tenderness and connection and a feeling of meaning and a feeling of being part of something greater. And many people have been subverted, manipulated by this dominant culture to turn those needs to basically compress them, repress them, and turn the energy that's needed into aggression, all these things. But if we can reach to that deeper layer both within ourselves and with others, that offers the ability for us to really begin to make a difference. Every one of those conversations that can happen or interactions on that place of compassion and kindness is an interaction that leads towards that flourishing future of an ecological civilization. Thank you for that. There, well, the last question is really, what have you experienced or learned in your journey so far professional or life journey so far that you wish you would have known from the start <laughs> well that's interesting yeah it's it's uh, a lot of people say it's the journey in and of itself yeah. as you take that yeah. journey that's 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 really uh itself and so i have a lot of people kind of uh, say that yeah. same thing but uh is there anything that you said boy i, I would have i i always for me personally it's, i wish i would have started 10 10 years earlier i wish i would have known yeah. this i would have jumped on it a lot right. sooner exactly exactly i think um well one one thing that it took me years to discover and it would, it would have been wonderful if i had, had realized it to begin with is that this whole way in which we make sense of the world right now is wrong um that it's it's such a mind blower to because you just think well surely and all these talking heads share these ideas and scientists seem to tell these us these things and it must be true and then we begin to once we realize that actually they're all part of the system that is this kind of self-reinforcing um like wrong ideology and that is that's astonishing but that that takes a lot of years um to really kind of unfold in a, a real sense of intentionality and curiosity. But I think maybe the thing that I, it took me some years myself to discover is just how many wonderful, incredible uh, people are in the world right now actually creating a different world who have been through their own personal journeys of discovery, their own personal uh, times of of despair and moving towards something else, and that what e the the project each of us have is not to sort of come up with our own solution and try to like bang that that particular saucepan over everyone's head and say this is the answer, but actually to look at the incredible, amazing, and um, innovative, brilliant life affirming work that's being done by so many communities, so many people around the world, and connect with those to feel that sense of humility that comes with being seeing we're part of something so much bigger and then that allows the sense of empowerment to once we begin to share, like lose our own identity of selfhood and realize we're part of this incredible process that's so much bigger than we are like wow how exciting it is to be able to offer my part to this incredible unfolding opportunity the Web of Meaning. This is the book, in my opinion, the book of the century. It's going to go down in history. Uh, it's so fabulous. I recommend everybody uh, pick it up. Jeremy, thank you so much for letting us inside of your ideas. It's been a sure pleasure. We could talk for days and hours uh, because 
there's so much to cover. I, I love your visions. I love how you're helping us on this journey to, to find meaning and also get to this critical mass of these ecological civilizations. Uh, I, I really thank you very much. And I hope we can talk again very soon. Thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you, Mark. It's been a great pleasure being in conversation with you. I look forward to a lot more in the future. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.